Welcome to Graceland Cemetery in Chicago, Illinois. We're just a little bit north of downtown in Wrigleyville, and this is one of the most historic and beautiful cemeteries in the city of Chicago. Today, I'll give you a personal tour and show you the final resting places of many famous and notable people in this cemetery. Let's go check it out. Now, the first location we're going to check out, this is called Eternal Silence. And this is a sculpture that was done in 1909 by an artist named Laredo Taft. And this is to commemorate the grave of a man named Dexter Graves. And he, in 1831, he led a group of 13 families from Ohio to settle in Chicago. Dexter Graves died in 1844, 75 years before the statue's creation and 16 years before Graceland Cemetery was founded. Now, his body was presumably relocated from his original resting place at the Old City Cemetery. Now, this is also one of the city's most legendary haunted legends and lore. It's said that if you look at the eyes of this, that you can actually see how you're going to die. And it's also said that this is the inspiration for the blue ghost on the Ouija board. Here is the final resting place of Marshall Field, who was a celebrated name in retail and Chicago history. In 1865, he and Levi Ziegler Leader joined the merchandising firm of Potter Palmer. When Palmer withdrew, the firm became Field Leader and Company, and in 1881, Field bought out Leader for $2.5 million, naming it Marshall Field and Company. In an age of unethical merchandising, Field emphasized customer service, liberal credit, the one-price system, privilege of returning merchandise, and the department store restaurant. Field is credited with the phrases, give the lady what she wants, and the customer is always right. Field's estate was valued at $125 million. Among his beneficiaries were the University of Chicago and the Columbian Museum, which was later named the Field Museum of Natural History. His grandson Marshall Field III founded the Chicago Sun-Times afterwards, and Marshall Field passed away in 1906. This is William LeBaron Jenny. He was an architect and an engineer known for building the first skyscraper in 1884. He joined the Union Army as an engineer in the Civil War, and he designed fortifications for Generals Sherman and Grant. In Chicago, he designed the Ludington Building and the Manhattan Building, both built in 1891, and are National Historic Landmarks. Jenny is best known for designing the 10-story home insurance building in Chicago. The building was the first fully metal-framed building and is considered the first skyscraper. It was built from 1884 to 1885, and enlarged by adding two stories in 1891. It was demolished in 1931. He passed away in Los Angeles, California on June 15, 1907. Here is the final resting place of Peter Schoenhofen. He was a beer maker and immigrated to Chicago in the 1850s, and he started working in the brewery trade. In 1861, he formed a partnership with Matthias Gottfried and opened a brewery together. They made about 600 barrels of beer a year. Schoenhofen bought out his partner in 1867. The company became the Peter Schoenhofen Brewing Company, and the annual output had increased to about 10,000 barrels a year. At the time of his death, the business was churning out an annual output of 180,000 barrels. In 1900, the Schoenhofen family regained control of the company, which employed about 500 people at its brewery. It's now known as Edelweiss Beer. Peter Schoenhofen passed away in 1893 at the age of 65. And I would also like to add that this is one of the most interesting monuments in this cemetery. It is very old, it's very rustic, and it's very classy. As you can see, very elaborate decorations. I'll show you the other side here so you can see the get the general idea for how big this monument actually is. And here's the final resting place of boxing legend Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson was born March 31st, 1878 in Galveston, Texas, and he was nicknamed the Galveston Giant. He was one of the best boxers of his time, and he also became the first black heavyweight boxing champion from 1908 to 1915. 
His fight in 1910 against James J. Jeffries was dubbed the fight of the century. Johnson was one of the most influential boxers of all time, and he earned considerable sums of money endorsing various products, including medicines. He had several expensive hobbies such as automobile racing and tailored clothing, as well as purchasing jewelry and furs for his wives. On June 10, 1946, Johnson and a friend visited a segregated diner. When the diner refused to serve him, Johnson drove away angry with his friend in the passenger seat. The car collided with a telephone pole on U.S. Highway 1 near Franklinton, North Carolina. While his friend survived the crash, Johnson suffered fatal injuries and died later that day. He was 68 years old. And here's a look at one of the many beautiful memorials here in the cemetery. Over here is the final resting place of John Kinsey. John Kinsey was a fur trader from Quebec who was first operated in Detroit in what became the Northwest Territory of the United States. In 1802, Kinsey moved with his wife and child to Chicago, where they were among the first permanent non-indigenous settlers. Kinsey Street in Chicago is also named after him. In 1812, Kinsey murdered Jean Lalime, who worked as an interpreter at Fort Dearborn in Chicago. This was also known as the first murder in Chicago. During the War of 1812, Kinsey was accused of treason by the British and imprisoned on a ship for transport to Great Britain. After escaping, he returned to the American territory, settling again in Chicago by 1816. He lived there the rest of his years until his passing in 1828. Just over here rests Victor Lawson. Victor Lawson was born in Chicago to a Norwegian immigrant laborer who prospered in real estate. He became publisher of the Chicago Daily News, and over 29 years, Lawson's newspaper, business innovations included advancements in promotion, classified advertising, syndication of news stories, serials, and comics. Laredo Taft's 1931 Crusader stands guard over his unmarked grave here. Over the years, Lawson was known for anonymously contributing to many charities, which benefited a lot of people in the Chicago area. Now, even though his grave is unmarked, it is marked with the phrase, Above all things, truth beareth away the victory. But this is the Laredo Taft statue that stands guard over Victor Lawson's unmarked grave. Now let's just take a quick pause so I can tell you guys that this is right in the middle of the city. There is a train track on one side and there are busy streets on all the other sides of the cemetery. It is right in the heart of Wrigleyville, but it is well worth the visit. This is John Wellborn Root. He was an American architect who was born in 1891 in Lumpkin, Georgia, but moved to Chicago and teamed up with Daniel Burnham, with whom he formed the firm of Burnham & Root, where they partnered for 18 years. He was one of the founders of the Chicago school style. Root developed the floating raft system of interlaced steel beams to create a foundation for tall buildings that would not sink in Chicago's marshy soil. Root's first use of this revolutionary system was for the Montauk Building in 1882. The work from his prime years has been recognized for significance by being designated as National Historic Landmarks, National Register of Historic Places, and Chicago Landmarks, and it also includes the famous Rookery Building. He worked on the plan for the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Before it was constructed, Root died of pneumonia in 1891 at the age of 41. Over here we have George Pullman. He was an industrialist and an engineer, and he was known for luxury rail cars. Pullman made his original fortune by raising buildings. His system of using groups of men with jacks elevated buildings so smoothly that businesses could continue to operate during this procedure. Pullman then invested in his Pullman rail car empire, culminating in the creation of the town bearing the Pullman name. At his death, he was known for refusing to negotiate with unions, and his family feared desecration of this grave here. His Graceland tomb was built with steel-reinforced concrete. 
After Pullman's passing, the Pullman Company merged in 1930 with Standard Steel Car Company to become Pullman Standard, which built its last car for Amtrak in 1982. This is the famous Ryerson tomb. This is Martin Ryerson Sr. He was a successful lumber baron and became wealthier in real estate. His son, Martin Ryerson Jr., joined the lumber business after several years of practicing law. Ryerson Sr. was a trustee at the Art Institute of Chicago, an incorporator of the Field Museum, and he was involved in founding the University of Chicago, and he was a member of its first board of trustees. The Ryerson tomb, designed by architect Louis H. Sullivan, melded two Egyptian-styled buildings, the Pyramid and the Mastaba. Martin Ryerson Sr. passed away in 1887, and Martin Ryerson Jr. passed away in 1932. Over here is William Wallace Kimball. He was born in Rumford, Maine, and made his fortune in real estate. Before the Panic of 1857, he moved to Chicago and acquired a music store. In 1879, he began building pianos and organs, and was so successful that in 1882, he went into full-scale production. Kimball Avenue in Chicago was named after him, and he has one of the most impressive monuments here at Graceland Cemetery. As you can see over here, there's a very beautiful angel and a little bit creepy if you want to go that route, but it really doesn't appear to have a face, as you can see right here. But William Wallace Kimball was a very important man in the city of Chicago, and when it came to the production of music instruments, and he passed away in the city of Chicago in 1904. And here we have Louis Sullivan, Sullivan was an influential architect of the Chicago School and is often called the prophet of modern architecture. He conceived the phrase, forum ever follows function. Among his works are the Auditorium Theater, the Carson Peary Scott Store, and the Charnley House. He influenced the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, who spent over six years as Sullivan's chief draftsman. Sullivan's architecture is a mix of plain geometry an undisguised massing punctuated with elaborate pockets of ornamentation in stone, wood, and terracotta. He was buried with a small stone marker, but in five years, a more fitting memorial was designed by Thomas Tallmadge with Sullivan's profile set in one of his own designs. Louis Sullivan passed away in 1924. And over here is a coyote on the loose, which you frequently see here at Graceland Cemetery. This is the Lakeside Monument to Potter Palmer. In 1852, Palmer opened a dry goods store on Lake Street, then Chicago's Commercial Center, and was among the first to appreciate the importance of attractive displays, including prices of goods and the value of heavy advertising. Palmer also allowed customers to take goods on approval and charge purchases. Soon, most Chicago merchants adopted the Palmer system, which was kind of the first line of credit. This is also where Potter Palmer's family is laid to rest. Now, in 1865, Marshall Field and Levi Leader took over creating Field, Palmer, and Leader, later named Marshall Field & Company. He invested heavily in real estate and brought all of Chicago's principal stores to State Street, redefining its business district. He is best known for building the Palmer House Hotel. Palmer helped to lay out Lakeshore Drive and was an original incorporator of the Chicago Board of Trade and helped plan the World's Columbian Exposition. Potter Palmer passed away in 1902. Here we have William Goodman. He was born in 1848, and he was an American lumber tycoon. He came to Chicago and is famous for helping to find the Goodman Theater through a gift of $250,000, which was an insane amount of money back then. The donation was made in memory of his son, Kenneth Saar Goodman, a playwright who had envisioned a theater which elevated professional training and performance standards. Notable architect Howard Van Doren Shaw designed the tomb memorializing Goodman's son. William Goodman passed away in 1936. 
And this is Charles Wacker, whose name would sound familiar if you came from Chicago. Now, he was born in Chicago, and Wacker was a businessman and a brewer and a philanthropist. He was also vice chairman of the General Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago and chairman of the Chicago Plan Commission. As commission chairman, he championed Daniel Burnham's plan for improving the city of Chicago, including public addresses and publishing Wacker's Manual of the Plan of Chicago as a textbook for local school children. Now, Charles Wacker is also the namesake of Wacker Drive in Chicago. This is Charles Wacker's final resting place. Now, he passed away in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin in 1929. And in one of the most peaceful places in Graceland Cemetery lies Daniel Burnham. Daniel Burnham was born in 1846, and he was perhaps the most influential architect and urban planner in Chicago history. Now, Burnham became a draftsman for famed architect William LeBaron Jenny, father of the modern skyscraper who we showed you earlier. In 1873, he persuaded friend and colleague John Root to form their own architectural firm, Burnham & Root, which became known for the 10-story Montauk block, perhaps the first building to be labeled a skyscraper. The Rookery, the second Rand McNally building, and the Menandak building, and the Masonic Temple. He was director of the works at the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, and he believed that an improved urban environment could provide a positive transformative experience for inhabitants. Burnham's master work, the 1909 Plan of Chicago, is considered a landmark in urban planning history. Daniel Burnham passed away in 1912. Here lies Philip Armour. Armour was born on a farm in upstate New York, and he initially gained financial success when he made $8,000 during the California Gold Rush. During the American Civil War, Armour capitalized on the opportunity to sell meat to the United States Army, making millions in the process and becoming Chicago's largest meatpacking company. Armour also started canning pork products, the urgent army need for meat during the Spanish-American War of 1898 led to highly publicized complaints about sending chemically treated meat to the soldiers, which tarnished the company's reputation in the early 1900s. Armour was also a philanthropist investing in the Armour Mission, a non-denominational community center sponsoring classes and activities for children. The Armour Institute, later renamed Illinois Institute of Technology, also taught engineering and architecture at a nominal cost. Armour passed away in Chicago in 1901. And if you're a baseball fan, over here rests the legendary Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks was a legendary player for the Chicago Cubs from 1953 to 1971. He was known as Mr. Cub, and he was a very well-liked man in the Chicago area. He played his entire career in the city of Chicago, and he was very beloved in the city. He was a member of the 500 Home Run Club and also a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's widely regarded as one of the best baseball players of all time. And on a more personal level, Ernie Banks had a great attitude, and he was one of the first people in the clubhouse to be energetic and excited about playing the game of baseball. He uplifted his teammates and he also did the same thing in his personal life. If you ever ran into Ernie Banks in the city of Chicago, he was just the absolutely nicest guy. He was kind of almost like the honorary mayor of Chicago. He was everywhere. He would be at Harry Carey's restaurant and you would run into him pretty much everywhere. But he was just an absolutely great guy. And as you can see, he was also a 14-time All-Star, two-time National League MVP, and he played 2,528 games. Just an absolute legend of a baseball player. And he will be widely regarded as one of the greatest ever play in the city of Chicago. Now, the other side of his gravestone also has the number 14, which was his number. And it was also retired by the Chicago Cubs. It also says on here, it's a great day for a ball game, and let's play too, which was Ernie Banks' catchphrase. Now, one of the other notable things about Ernie Banks is in 2013, 
Ernie was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama for his contribution to sports. That was one of his prouder moments, and it is memorialized here on his gravestone. Ernie Banks passed away in the city of Chicago in 2015 and was laid to rest right here at Graceland Cemetery. Here lies Cyrus McCormick. McCormick was an industrialist and inventor of the first commercially successful reaper, which is a horse-drawn machine to harvest wheat. He formed what became McCormick Harvesting Machine Company, where he innovated marketing and distribution techniques. McCormick's achievements have impacted agriculture business around the world. Cyrus McCormick passed away in 1884. This over here is William Hulbert. Hulbert was born in 1832 when he was part owner of the Chicago White Stockings, later to become the Cubs. He and Albert Spaulding founded the National League in 1876. He was elected president of the National League and is credited with establishing respectability through opposition to betting, rowdiness, and other abuses in the game. His monument in the shape of a baseball is one of the most unique in Graceland Cemetery and features the eight original cities that comprise the National League. William Hulbert passed away in Chicago in 1882 at the age of only 49. Here we have Alan Pinkerton. Pinkerton was born in Scotland in 1819, and he was one of America's first undercover agents. He was also a Civil War scout and guardian of President Abraham Lincoln. He kept Lincoln safe on his voyage to Washington, D.C. after becoming elected president, here is an archival photo of Alan Pinkerton while protecting President Abraham Lincoln. This is one of the few photos of the two of them that exists. He founded the Pinkerton National Detective Agency, providing detective services, capturing train robbers and counterfeiters. The agency had the world's largest collection of mugshots and a criminal database. The agency's logo, the all-seeing eye, inspired the term private eye, the Pinkerton Agency is widely regarded as one of the first law enforcement agencies and a prequel to the FBI. Alan Pinkerton passed away in Chicago in 1884. You can't really discuss the Pinkertons without thinking of Kate Warren. This is the final resting place of Kate and she was an American law enforcement officer best known as the first female detective in the United States. She worked for the Pinkerton National Detective Agency, and she had a huge role in uncovering the 1861 Baltimore plot against President-elect Abraham Lincoln. She recruited female agents for the Pinkerton Agency and intelligence work for the Union during the American Civil War. Now the strange thing about her final resting place is that her name is actually misspelled on her gravestone. Her name is actually spelled W-A-R-N-E. She did have a very short career though as she passed away in the city of Chicago at the age of only 35. Now we would be missing one of the greatest legends and lores of Chicago if we didn't mention the statue of Inez Clark. Now, Inez Clark is one of Chicago's biggest legends and myths, and at Graceland Cemetery, she's one of two. There is the Inez Clark statue, and there's Eternal Silence. Now, for a little history, Inez Clark, this is the grave with a statue of a young girl. It's marked Inez and daughter of J.N. and M.C. Clark. Now, for decades, the girl's identity had been in question. Nobody really knew who she was. It's now all but certain that the girl's name was Inez Briggs, and she was the daughter of Mary C. Clark from a previous marriage. Now, legends of the girl have been numerous, and one states that she died when she was struck by lightning during a picnic when she was locked outside. Now, from, from this came another that the statue disappears during thunderstorms because Inez is afraid of the lightning and the storms. Now, it's a very beautiful statue. She was only six years old when she passed away, whether you believe her name was Inez Clark or Inez Briggs. It is a sad story. 
but people throughout the years, especially people that work in this cemetery, have claimed that when it storms, that she disappears from this case. Now, whether you believe in that kind of thing or not is completely up to you, but this is one of the most notorious and interesting legends in the city of Chicago. However you look at it, though, and whatever you believe, this is a very beautiful statue and a great monument to a, to a girl that passed away way too soon. But this is the statue of Inez Clark that supposedly disappears during thunderstorms. Thanks for joining us on this tour of Graceland Cemetery in Chicago, Illinois. Be sure to subscribe for future videos.